Today I want to talk to you a little bit about someone who I had a chance to spend a great deal of time with. And he, he's passed away now, it's been a couple of years. In fact, he passed away on the day that I arrived here in Australia the first time in 2016. He was based in the UK, originally from India, and he was a Hafiz of the Qur'an. And he was the first person, to our knowledge, who led the Taraweeh of the complete Qur'an in UK. This is in the 1950s. After spending about a year or so in the UK, he wrote back to his Shaykh saying that, I don't think I can survive here. There are hardly any Muslims, there's no environment, there are no mosques, no one practices, in fact everyone runs away from Islam. And I, I'm worried about myself. He was a young man. I'm worried about my own Iman, my own Islam, what will become of me. So the Shaykh replied saying that we're going for Hajj this year, why don't you meet us there? And then we'll talk. So the Shaykh did just that, he, he went and after completing Hajj they were in Medina Munawwara sitting in Masjid Nabawi. So the Shaykh whose name was Shaykh Yusuf Rahimahullah, he asked this Hafiz whose name was Muhammad and his surname was Patel. So he was most commonly known as Hafiz Patel. He said, okay tell us what your issue is. So he presented his condition and there were many shuyukh sitting there. So Shaykh Yusuf said, look, tell me something, all around the Haram of Medina, what do you see? He said, marketplace, stores. He said, that merchandise, where is it all coming from? He said, it's coming from different parts of the world. Some of it is from one country, some of it is from another. A lot of it, a lot of the brand name things are coming from, from Europe. He said, isn't that interesting? That they were able to bring their merchandise right up to the Haram. The Haramain in fact. And when you go outside you'll find merchandise from, coming from the western countries. And it's readily available there. So they've surrounded our Haram with their own environment so to speak through their merchandise. So why don't you go to their countries, go to their London and create an environment of the Haram and bring the merchandise of the Haram there which is Hidayat, the guidance. That's what spread from Makkah and Medina. And then he became very serious and with tears in his eyes he said that Hafiz if you were to do this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you the Imam of your time. So Hafiz Patel sahab, rahimahullah, decided that that's it, I'm going and my work is cut out for me. And after coming back to the UK, he started working on people. And at that time, many people wouldn't listen to him. People would make fun of him. They would say, what's wrong with this guy? You know, we've all come here to make a living for ourselves and we are so eagerly adopting the ways of the Western culture and he's telling us about Deen and Sunnah and so on and so forth. What is this backward approach? But he continued working and he worked for decades. He worked on the masses, he worked on the youth, on the elders, on anyone and everyone. And one year when, when I was with him, that would have been 1996, he did a survey around UK that how many places have taraweeh of the complete Qur'an. And the people that did the survey, they told him that it was close to a thousand places. And then he told me this story that when he came, he was the first person to lead taraweeh of the whole Qur'an on the land of UK. When this man neared the end of his life, he 
had become one of the most influential figures in all of Europe. Thousands and thousands of people took guidance from him and through him and through his efforts and through people that he prepared to do the effort. And his influence reached countries where he did not spend much time. Today, in Albania, there is a masjid that's named after him and there's a highway, there's a freeway that's named after him because of the influence that his effort had on that area in preserving Islam after the effects of communism. This man, I observed for many, many years and he had a habit of not just praying to Hajjud, but he would spend one hour praying to Hajjud and one hour making dua every single night. And he would take his time in tahajjud and he would take his time in dua and he would take the names of anyone who had requested him for dua and he would take the names of all of those people that he felt needed dua and, and he would cry in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. And he has left behind a legacy of thousands of people and though he was not a full-fledged alim as we would say, hundreds and hundreds of people became ulama through him. And he was the murabbi of ulama. He was the one who mentored ulama and took care of them and trained them and disciplined them and put them to work around the world. Sometimes we look around and we get disheartened by the overwhelming environment. We say, well, how are we? If we tell a youngster to guard their gaze, we say, what are you talking about? In this environment, how are you possibly supposed to guard your gaze? You talk to someone about having a sunnah appearance, they say, it looks so awkward in this society. What will people say? We talk to girls about hijab, they'll say, it's very difficult. Our friends, you know, look at us so awkwardly. We, we, we are made to feel so uncomfortable. So all of these are realities. But there is also another reality that all of this can change. And it can change to such that through the efforts of this man, if you were to go to those cities where he worked on, where he laid the foundations of his work, you would think that there in the middle of the, of the UK are cities that are completely Islamic. You'll go to areas where you'll hardly find anyone who is not wearing Islamic dress. In the middle of the UK. When there was a time, people of that country told me, because in the old days, the way the houses were made, the toilets would not be inside the house. There would be a little outhouse in front of the house, a small structure. So they would go there to use the toilet. People were so intimidated, Muslims included, were so intimidated that just to go out to use the toilet, they would change their clothes. They'd, put on, they'd, they'd be wearing their traditional clothes maybe inside the house. But just to use the toilet, they'd put on a nice pair of pants and a shirt and then go because my British neighbors might see me. What would they say if they see me dressed like that? From that level of intimidation and hesitation to a level where you can you will go and roam about and you will be amazed at what you see. You see ladies, almost every woman is wearing either a niqab or at least a hijab. Little children are walking around with, with the sunnah caps. And subhanallah, you will think that you're in a Muslim country. This is not a coincidence that happens. This is people getting to work. This is people really digging down and saying, no, we're going to make a difference. We're going to change the environment. And it's possible. And people like Hafiz Patel Saab, rahimahullah, showed us that it can be done and it can be done today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to be inspired by these people and follow in their footsteps and use us also for the spreading of hidayat. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa